everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me again for the second um, session of Church History. Um, I'm kind of a person that simplifies everything. So this is more like Church History for Dummies. Uh, if you want to find some really good teachers online, there are some really fantastic Church History teachers online. One of them, I must say, which I have been enjoying is a man named Brian Gore. Um, and he's a Presbyterian minister and his teaching is fantastic. So I'm not going to um, reinvent the wheel. I'm not going to go over the things that he um, has said, which is really good. And he is online where you'll be able to find him. Um, and he talks a lot about each personality, historical personality um, going and, and, and it's really worth listening to. So um, I would just encourage you to look at Brian Gore's work um, and um, one learns a lot from the Christian leaders of the past. Um, and <clears throat> so it's great to reflect on these great men and women of God. Um, so, but today what I would like to talk about is, well, last week I spoke about the persecution of the church and we looked at the physical persecution of the church and how the Christians suffered physically um, during the time of the em emperors. There were many emperors that were uh, against Christianity because the Christians did not worship the emperor, um, whereas that was what they were supposed to be doing, is worshipping the emperor. Every year they would have to go <clears throat> to the council and um, declare that they were in obeisance and they were um, uh, ex accepted total submission from the emperor to the point of worship. And so because they weren't doing this, they were being mightily persecuted. Now the Roman Empire at that time was huge. I think I showed you a map last time and I will show you a map again. And as time went by, it grew even more <clears throat> in, in, in um, it's expanded throughout uh, the Western, Western Europe and North Africa. So it was, a, it was a massive, huge empire. And so sporadically, um, there would be persecution throughout the Roman Empire, just like what it is a bit like in China at the moment. There's always persecution going on, not all over China, but China is such a massive continent. So there's places where flames of persecution will suddenly emerge from, from different pl places, or there might be a little bit of peace in one place, and there'll be flames of persecution in another place depending on who is in leadership there in the cities and that so this was kind of like what it was like in the the roman empire there would be certain places where it would be peaceful but other places if there was proconsuls there that were anti-christian there would be huge persecution and they would always hurl at the christians the fact that they did not worship the emperor that was one of the main things that the christians really suffered from um, so, but today we're going to talk a bit about the persecution that took place intellectually. Um, Christians, it was still very, very early um, in Christi uh, that the Christian um, movement had begun, thank thankfully because of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. So there was those that eventually emerged during this intellectual persecution, um, intellectual men of God that had found Jesus as their savior and started to use their, their um, expertise to, uh, you know, to defend the faith of Christianity, which was such a necessary thing at that time because the church was still in its seminal um, form. So, these wonderful men started to emerge, thank God for them. And they are what's called the apologists of the time, and between the time of 33 and 325. So if you've got this book, Church and History, okay, uh, they will be able to see on page 15 that uh, this is where we're going to go from chapter 3, and we're going to carry on here. But what I would like to really share with you today uh, during this time is the different philosophies in that that were in the world at the time mainly greek philosophies um but we're going to look at judaism because Ju that's where christianity comes from the roots of christianity come out of the hebrew out of the hebrew culture out of the hebrew scriptures so but because of the fact that christianity had come to the greek world which was the main 
culture of the world of the time, uh, Christianity had to relate itself to the philosophies um, of the day. But let's just look at Judaism, for example, just very simply. <clears throat> when we look at Judaism, it's quite different from the philosophies, the Greek philosophies, and mainly Judaism was different from Greek philosophies because of the fact that flesh and the material world was important, okay? The material world was sacred because in the scriptures it says that God created the world and he looked at the world and it was good unto him. So material world, our bodies, our flesh is sacred unto God. Um, and so, so because of that, we can um, celebrate uh, our bodies and we can celebrate in this beautiful created world. But the Greek philosophies and most of them, in fact, all of them, did not see it that way. They saw the body as a prison cell where... Uh, our spirits are kept, captivated, and only once our bodies died uh, could our spirits be set free. It is this kind of element of thought that the world actually really isn't really real. So they approached the, um, the proof of existence through the spirit man. In other words, what the Platonists actually said was that... Um, I think, therefore I am. It's like what uh, René Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Uh, and then you get on the other side, you've got a guy named Aristotle. And Aristotle had a completely different premise of approach to existence. And his approach was, I am, therefore I think. In other words, we, we actually become conscious of our existence because we are in a body and we have a brain and we can think. Whereas with Plat Plato, his um, proof of existence and consciousness of existence was because we have a spirit, that is how come we can understand our existence. Okay, so it was different. It was two different um, sides of the spectrum that Aristotle and Plato were coming from. But then also, how did these guys actually see God? This is the question. So when we look at Judaism, for example, we see that God is revealed through progressive revelation, because that is Hebrew thought all over. God is to be experienced. He is to be experienced within our, our spirits, yet we can see God at work in our world, okay, um, God is active in, he, in the Hebrew thought. He is very active. And we can see him being active when we read the scriptures and see the wonderful miracles of God. He is active in this world because this is a created world by him and he loves this world. But then how do we approach God in Judaism? How do we come to know God? This is the question. And in Judaism, to come to know God, one has to Climb the ladder, and the ladder to God is the law, okay? So through knowing the law, through knowing Torah, that is how we come to know God, uh, who is the one that reveals himself through progressive revelation. So in Judaism, we see that the material world is sacred because it's created by God, and therefore the concept of God becoming flesh is accepted, so that is why we can accept that concept um, that Jesus actually became, he was a man. He was 100% God. He was 100% man. And he lived on this earth. He suffered on this earth. He, he experienced everything that we experienced. And then when he died and came back, he didn't come back as a phantom. He came back in the flesh and he said to his disciples, touch me for I am flesh and bone. He was, uh, he was solid. Now this was complete, this was a, a, a different line of thought than how the philosophers, the Greek philosophers thought. And as I said with Plato, his first premise to um, uh, being conscious of existence was through the spirit. So when we look at Plato, we see that Plato, um, his, his, um, his concept of God was that God was supreme being, he was divine light, 
and he was true reality. So he he actually had this um, this this philosophy whereby God sometimes would send an emanation from himself, and this emanation would be like a holy man that would come and and um, and, and and enlighten the the world of the time and uh, so he was seen more as divine light so when we read the gospel of john for example we see that john uses the word light a lot um he uses it but one of the reasons being because he the apostle john was a great apologist and he was actually defending the, the faith against many of these philosophies that were starting to emerge at that time and so he uses the word light because Jesus himself said I am the light of the world so the concept of light could actually be grasped by the Greek mind how does one approach God in platonic thought well if God is divine light then to approach God would be through meditation, through actually receiving this light into oneself and through through meditating upon this wonderful light. And also by experiencing the emanations of God uh, that would send down to earth. So in Platonism, there was a distinction between the material world and the spirit world, a huge distinction. And it was the spirit world that would eclipse the material world. It was the spirit world that was significant and the material world was not significant. The material world cannot be reconciled to God. That's what they believed um, uh, because God is spirit. God is God is light. He is spirit. So how can he reconcile himself to this material world, this fallen world? Uh, therefore, the concept of God becoming flesh cannot be accepted. So that is that was one of the things that was really hard for the Greek mind to, to grasp that Jesus actually lived upon this earth as a human being. He wasn't a demiurge. He wasn't like um, a demigod. He was true man. And um, it was very hard for the Platonists to grasp this thought. And the fact that Jesus actually rose again in the flesh was like totally taboo. It was like really hard to grasp that because the, the spirit was what we were aiming for, the spirit, our spirit to be released from our bodies. So that was how Plato saw um, the world and um, our existence. And then, of course, you've got his counterpart, which was Aristotle. Now, Aristotle was born in 384 before Christ. And Aristotle's whole premise was at the other end of the spectrum, basically. His, to cut it down really short and to make it as simple as possible, he said, I am, therefore I think, whereas Plato said, I think, therefore I am. And so um, Aristotle, um, he saw the world um, as material world and only through the material world could we grasp the deeper things of life. And so that was his main line of thought. How did he see God? Well, he saw God as the first cause, the principle of existence, the unmoved mover, who was not a personal being, by the way. He was just the unmoved mover and he was totally distant from humanity. How did one um, actually reach God? How does one actually connect with God in the Aristotelian thought? Through reason and logic really was so seen through the material world was proof of existence so Aristotelian thought only actually started to really emerge after the Crusades because when you look at um, the the early church and you look at which was steeped in Greek philosophy um, the, the the prominent philosopher throughout uh, the early church the Constantine church uh, right through the Middle Ages was mainly Platonic thought. And um, so Aristotle only, his, his line of thought only appeared after the Crusades. And it was from this premise of Aristotelian thought that we get the whole um, Darwinian um, um, understanding of the world. But we will go into that a little later. 
Okay, so then carrying on, we see that there was another wonderful, well, there was a wonderful philosopher, and his name was Philo, Philo. Probably that's where we get the word philosophy, I'm not sure. But now Philo was a Jewish philosopher, so he was a Hellenist Jew. So what he had done is he had synchronized, he had brought together um, uh, Hebrew thought and Greek thought together, which was quite a difficult thing to do, but that's what Philo did. So he saw God as supreme being, okay, which sort of slotted into the Greek line of thought, but he also saw God as the Hebrew Yahweh, okay, and um, so, and he, because he was a Hebrew, because he was Jewish, he saw the world as sacred, as, as uh, it was create, the created world was a sacred place. Now, how in, in his, um, in his understanding, did he, did he see man reaching God? Well, he saw God as the Logos, and he saw, which in Hebrew is wisdom. So he then combined the Logos, which is the word, which was very, um, uh, very Greek in thought, and he saw wisdom, which was very Hebrew and is found throughout the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, um, as a way to to actually reach God. So it was the word and it was wisdom that helped us to actually reach God. And how does one get wisdom? Well, according to Philo, the practice of asceticism and mysticism brought us to the place where we could find God. What is asceticism? Asceticism is where you actually um, Deprive yourself, deprive your body of all the, the, the desires and the fleshly longings of the world. And you deprive yourself basically from all those things like fasting and, and um, um, bringing your body into subjection, which Paul talks about quite a lot. Um, and so this was a way to reach God. And yet in Philo's line of thought, the created world was sacred. So Philo kind of like brought uh, the Greek thought and Hebrew thought together and, um, it, you know, he made it kind of palatable for both, both cultures. Um, so I kind of like Philo. He's one of my favorite philosophers. Uh, I think he was really grappling and he was really trying to reconcile the Greek world and the Hebrew world into one. So out of all these uh, things came a, um, which comes later and emerges during the time of like Apostle John. This is how early this, the next um, um, philosophy started to emerge, which was Gnosticism. Now Gnosticism started to emerge, like I say, during the time of Apostle, Paul, Apostle John even, which was really early. Um, when John, Apostle John wrote the book of John, uh, he was kind of around about 80, 90 years old, so he was really old, and he was actually not going to write the book of John, but his disciples said you, he, he must do it. So he, that's why his, his book is a bit different from the Synoptic Gospels, um, because he was actually, in, in lots of ways, he was an apologetic. He was actually defending the faith in many ways um, by writing the book of John. So it's often we find terminology that's very um, philosophical, uh, where the philosophers would actually be able to um, relate to the term terminology that John used in, in the Gospel of John. So, but out of, during this time, a, a philosophy was starting to emerge and it was Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism was where combining of philosophy, the Greek philosophy with Christianity, because a lot of the Gnostics now, they were like totally impressed. They were totally enlightened by the words of Jesus, but they were philosophers and they weren't willing to let go of their philosophies to follow Jesus totally and completely. So they kind of like brought the gospel message into this whole philosophical line of thought. And so, of course, they went into a lot of error. And so it was people like Apostle John and Paul and Peter um, that had to actually combat these lines of thought. So Gnosticism, Gnosticism um, actually came in different forms, okay? There was quite a few like 
um, early teacher, early teachers, early leaders even of the Christian church, who, for example, Marcion, um, who was actually quite Gnostic in his ways, with Christian leaders that were actually quite Gnostic in their line of thought. And so Gnosticism had already creeped into the teachings of, of, Chris, of the Bible. So Gnosticism um, actually saw God okay, as supreme. And in, in the line of Gnosticism, what they believed was that, that the supreme God sent these aeons, these heavenly revealers, okay, down to earth. And Jesus was one of these heavenly revealers. And so because he was, um, he came forth, he emanated from the supreme one, um, he was not human or there was that different lines of thought. Some believe that Jesus was just a man and he received the Christ spirit, okay, um, from the Supreme One. So he became like a uh, he, an emanation, so he received the Christ spirit. Then others, other Gnostics, believe that Jesus was uh, not actually a man. He was, he was a demigod, okay, so he was actually an emanation that came from God, and he wasn't a man. So when he died, he wasn't dying as a human being. He was resurrected in the spirit, so he was more of a phantom. He wasn't resurrected in flesh. So uh, because of the fact that they were so anti anything to do with the flesh and anything to do with the material world. So there were different um, sides of the spectrum when it came to Gnosticism. So you could do a whole study on Gnosticism because there are so many different branches to Gnosticism. And so this is what made it even more dangerous for the, for the, for the church. Because there were so many branches to Gnosticism, it was so easy to fall into error um, because of all these different branches, which we're not going to really go into at the moment. So how did man approach God? How did man actually come to know God um, in, the, in the Gnostic uh, views through knowledge? Okay, so according to the Gnostics, we come to connect with God through knowledge. And it was this uh, like exclusive Gnostic knowledge that each of the different groups would give that would um, actually uh, be able to help a man to approach God through specific knowledge that the Gnostics had received. So to the Gnostics, the material world, space, time and matter was all evil. Okay, it was created by um, a demiurge or an architect. Okay, and the f and and also uh, it was Marcion who actually said that um, the God of the Old Testament was a foolish God. He was a different God from the God that we served, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a foolish God of the Old Testament. So even that was a, a part of Gnosticism, okay. Um, then there was the other side of the spectrum where you got Gnostics that, uh, that didn't care what they did with their bodies because their bodies were not, you know, their bodies were useless. They were a waste anyway. So let's just live the life and let's just go and get drunk and sleep with everybody and all that type of thing because our bodies mean nothing anyway. So there was that side of the spectrum of Gnosticism as well. And on the other side of the spectrum, there were those who would flagellate their bodies and, um, and fast for weeks and weeks and that type of thing to bring their bodies under subjection to the spirit. Um, and this was also a way of hating the, um, the, the material world, hating one's flesh. So uh, this is what, um, this was some of the philosophies that were going around. And so to actually um, understand what Christianity really was, we really needed the apostles to 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 work it out to codify what the bible was saying what the doctrines of christ was actually saying to the world at this time mm -hmm.